Thank you for joining us. I'm going to turn this over to our speaker tonight for American Pilgrims on the Camino. Emilio, take it away. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Allison. Um, it's, it's great to be here. My name is Emilio Escudero. I'm actually in uh, California in the San Francisco Bay Area. So it's uh, just late afternoon. <clears throat> I'm, I'm struggling with my voice. Um, I've been coughing and, and my voice is getting a little hoarse. So I hope um, everything comes through fine. Um, it's, um, it's great to see so many people interested in the, in the Knights Templar. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, in the early days, they were known as the poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon. And um, theirs, is, theirs is a great story. Uh, and it's, um, it's not fiction and it's not legend, it's actually a documented history. The, the Knights Templar were a religious order. Um, they were monks like um, Benedictines and Trappists are, are monks and they took vows like uh, most monks do. And um, um, although they were monks, they were not regular monks, they were warrior monks. And it was an unusual you know, religious order. Um, a lot of people also don't know that um, the, the Knights Templar were around for only about 185 years. And this is a, a chronologically small footprint, but historically um, they, they have a huge legacy. And their story like uh, today uh, will be told for, for many years to come. So um, buckle up, it's an amazing story and it's a complex story. I'll touch on the, on the high points of the, of the Templar history, but my focus is gonna be on the, the last 50 years or so um, of their history, their existence um, and um, essentially their demise. Um, to understand the, uh, this particular time in history, I'll also introduce three people, uh, a pope, a king, and uh, the last grandmaster of the Templars, uh, Jacques de Molay. Um, and I'll also touch on the legacy of the, of the Templars in relation to uh, the, the Camino de Santiago. As I mentioned, um, the, the Templar story is a complex story and it's complex for a number of reasons, but primarily because it's contemporaneous with a, a number of significant things that were going on um, around that time. For example, the, um, the spread and the rise and spread of Islam after the death of Mohammed, the, the, eight, the eight crusades, um, that happened around this time, the rise and fall of a number of rulers um, and kings actually in the, in the Middle East. And then finally, all kinds of political and religious intrigue um, and feuds um, between especially kings and popes around this time. To, to help you sort through some of the events and the people and the names, uh, I, I hope um, everyone got the, the um, timeline that I prepared uh, and was sent to you. And hopefully you've had a chance to review it and maybe to help keep some of these uh, names and um, keep, sort through all these names and uh, figure out who did what to whom and when. Let's start our story um, in uh, 33 AD. This is right after the death of Jesus of Nazareth. At that time, Judea and all of Jerusalem and that whole area was under uh, the, the Romans. And the Roman Empire was uh, ruled in this area until uh, 527. And at that point, the Roman Empire ceded control of the Middle East to the Byzantine Empire. But the Byzantines weren't around for long because about a hundred years after 527, um, the Holy Land um, 
uh, everything changed. In uh, 637, the, and um, the, in, in 637, the, the, um, uh, the entire Holy Land was um, overwhelmed by Islam. And this is just five years after the death of, of Muhammad. When Muhammad died in 632, uh, the, 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 the entire Middle East, um, all of Saudi Arabia, all of North Africa, much of the Iberian Peninsula, and even parts of Southern France were invaded and taken over by Islam. And as a consequence, um, the Holy Land um, was no longer available for pilgrims. It was very difficult, it was costly, and it was frankly dangerous. And um, as you might imagine, and probably you've read, uh, this was a huge blow uh, to the Catholic Church, to, to, to Christendom at that time. And um, although it was an unfortunate happening in terms of pilgrimage, uh, something good also happened. And um, if you remember from your history of the, of the Camino, a new pilgrimage was beginning to emerge in the West. And uh, that means that in uh, 814, the bones of St. James were uh, discovered um, in what's now known, uh, actually in Edia Flavia, in what's known today as, um, as uh, modern day Galicia. And I think we all know this story, so I won't get into that, but it's basically that beginning in the mid ninth century through the, the 15th century, um, the Camino de Santiago became the alternative to traveling to the Holy Land. And it was the um, Santiago de Compostela essentially became the new pilgrimage focus for all of Europe. Now, um, the painful reality that tra travel to the Holy Land uh, was no longer possible or easy uh, hit the Western Christen Christendom very hard. But, um, um, and times were, uh, were most difficult around the year 1009. But um, in about a hundred years after that, after 1009, um, something uh, decisive happened. A Pope decided to take action. And it was, uh, um, uh, it was Innocence II the, uh, the who proclaimed what we now know as the, uh, as the um, first pilgrimage, uh, first uh, crusade. In 1095, Urban II um, promoted commanded and some say even incited uh, the retaking of the Holy Land. Um, and uh, he proclaimed that it was um, uh, God's will. And he said that the um, sins would be forgiven. There were indulgences offered. And Urban also said that uh, anyone who went could keep any spoils, any booty that they were able to take from the infidel. So um, it was around this time that, let, let me just see my notes here for a second. Um, it was at this time when um, the crusade actually succeeded in, um, in taking back the Holy Land. This was one of the um, crusades that actually did succeed. And uh, this is where the Templars actually come into the story at the, at the, at the First Crusade. Um, and <clears throat> so four years after um, Urban II announced the Crusade, a large Christian force succeeded in retaking the great fortress of Jerusalem. And it was an horrific uh, event. It was um, a bloody event. 
once the walls of Jerusalem had been um, breached, a massacre ensued. And um, accounts for this from that time said that the um, um, the, wall, the, the blood of the defenders, the Jews and the Muslims that were actually defending Jerusalem uh, ran ankle deep in the Temple of Solomon. And at that time, tens of thousands uh, were actually slaughtered um, by the crusade. This, these were men, women, and children, almost the entire population of uh, Jerusalem. And it was in this bloody victory that actually the Templars came into being. And that's because nine of the knights who had actually taken part in the battle uh, remained behind. And these nine knights, led by uh, Hugh de Payen, decided that they were going to stay. And they set up their, their headquarters um, on the sacred temple mount near the, the uh, Temple of Solomon and they remained there. Nine years after um, that battle, the, those same knights uh, decided that they were gonna take vows and start create a, a, a religious order. And uh, some years after that, it was in 1129, that by papal decree, um, the Pope actually declares these knights to be um, a, an official militant religious order. Um, let me show you a few pictures about um, the Templars. The Templars um, had a reputation of being fierce uh, warriors. They never surrendered. Um, everyone knew that they were not afraid to die because by dying, they ensured themselves a place in heaven. Their dress was simple. Uh, it was a, a white, simple white habit emblazoned with a red cross uh, and worn over chain mail. And the red cross symbolized um, their, their dedication, their vocation to martyrdom. The Let's see. The Templars were, were knights. Um, they were aristocrats. Um, they were not common peasants or, um, or common folk. Um, they were trained, skilled, and disciplined warriors. They sometimes fought on foot, but they preferred to ride into battle as on specially trained horses, um, war horses. And, they're not, and their, their motto, the motto of the order was non nobis domine, non nobis. Said nomini tuo, that glorium. If any of you follow that in Latin, it's not unto us, Lord, not unto us, but unto your name, give glory. All right. So that's just a few things about the Templars. What's not often recognized is that the Templars were actually monks. And as with any religious order, um, the Templars had a monastic rule. And theirs was basically an offshoot of the, visit, uh, the Benedictine rule. And by it, they lived a, a strict religious observance. They took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And they also took a pledge to die if necessary in the protection of pilgrims and, um, and holy places. And while Templars were individually bound by poverty, the Templar order was not. And over the years, the order actually amassed uh, uh, huge fortunes, fortunes in donations and um, income producing properties that were leased to them um, over time from all over Europe. In less than a hundred years, uh, the order grew to somewhere between 15 to 20,000 members. And some people say that actually there were more, but <clears throat> only about 10% of that number were knights. 
the rest were sergeants or foot soldiers um, and, or others in um, support of a, of a huge um, uh, uh, organization. Um, Allison, are we still are we still live? Yes, but it looks like the sharing component, your PowerPoint is not shared. Do you want to try yeah, again? No, no, it's actually not shared now. I actually I took it down. Oh, so, okay. Oh, okay. It's just that I see all the screens uh, that there are, they're all frozen. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, yes, I can still hear you. And people are shaking their heads. Yes, they can. Yep, they can still hear you. Yep. Oh, okay, because my own my own screen is actually frozen too. So so okay, Emilio, what I can do is I can pull up the PowerPoint and be ready whenever you want to show it if you want to email it to me. Okay. Oh, I I can pull it up too. I think, okay. but if I can't, I, I'll I'll let you know. Um, let me just continue with with this, and then we'll get into a few more uh, PowerPoint slides. The the Templars grew rapidly uh, from their foundation, um, and this was all done under their their first uh, Grand Master Hugh de Payen. Uh, he established Templar houses um, all over Europe. And then he created provinces all over Europe, and each of which had a provincial master. He also began um, what became a complex administrative network um, that eventually extended um, throughout Europe, the Mediterranean, and it, its reach extended from, from Portugal to, to Armenia and from Scotland all the way back to the Holy Land. The, the Templars also in this moment of growth actually created a huge fleet of ships uh, to carry people and provisions uh, to and from the, uh, the Holy Land. And they also established an economy, an economy that was as large and vibrant as um, any of the great nations in, in Europe. And um, to create, to, to support this economy, they actually created a system of banking, banks, and they're considered to be um, the, the creators of the first international banking and finance system in the world. Not surprising, um, their great wealth soon attracted um, the attention of kings and rulers. Um, as bankers, they lent money to um, to kings, and in their later years, they lent, um, made loans to Philip IV, uh, King of France. And in doing so, they unfortunately um, contributed to their own demise. And let's see if I can, I can bring that up again. Um, yes, I think so. So um, having mentioned the, the, the Templars' huge wealth, let me now introduce um, the king in our story. And the king in our story is Philip IV of France. Philip became um, king when he was only 17 years old. Um, and because he was a handsome young man, he was called Philip the Fair, Philip the <clears throat> Fair. But Philip had another side. Uh, he was rigid, he was aristocratic, and he was uh, domineering. By the time that Philip was 46, he had amassed a huge national debt. Some of it had been inherited by, from his father, but most of it was the result of his own wars and um, national mismanagement of money. At some point, Philip um, decides that to make ends meet, um, he needs to borrow money. And he borrowed heavily from French Jews, from um, Lombard bankers, and he borrowed heavily from the Templars. Then, unfortunately, when, um, at least unfortunately for the, for the Templars, uh, when it became clear that Philip was not going to pay his debts, um, he decided, uh, well, he developed a plan. First of all, he decided that he was going to tax the church. 
And now this was unheard of in that time. No one had ever done this. And beside that, he actually expropriated income producing properties from monasteries and from uh, rich ab abbots. Then he decided um, that he was going to get rid of his lenders and um, thereby zero out his debts. And uh, in an absolutely brazen move, um, he expels all Jews from France at the time. And then he does the same thing with Lombard bankers and he expropriates their, their land and all their wealth. Then um, Philip turns his attention to the Templars uh, to eliminate the order so he can confiscate their immense wealth. And part of this plan was that he was going to do all of this with the help of the Pope, his friend, Clement V. So at this time, let me introduce Clement V, the Pope in our story. Clement's relatively short nine-year uh, papacy is a blemish on the Catholic Church. Uh, here, here's a few things about Clement. He was born uh, Bertrand de Gott uh, from a noble French family. He was um, a well-educated canon lawyer. And uh, Clement was... Um, not a cardinal. He was an ordinary French bishop. And if in those days, like it is today, uh, popes are selected from the College of Cardinals. And not being a cardinal, Clement um, wasn't even considered eligible to become pope. Um, and he was a, even a less likely candidate because um, he... Uh, had didn't have any connections in Rome and had never traveled outside of France. And lessening even more his chance of ever becoming Pope was the fact that there was an ongoing feud, uh, a feud that had existed for years um, between French kings and the popes. And the root of that feud was the fact that the French kings at that time argued that because they believed that their power to rule was greater than that of the Pope. They should be the ones in charge or be able to approve or not approve the creation of bishops and um, cardinals in the French church. Obviously, the, the popes had disagreed with this idea, and um, there were huge problems uh, in, um, in the, between the papacy and the French church at that time. And <clears throat> as might be expected, um, Bertrand, um, being a Frenchman through and through, um, his, loyalty, his loyalties were with the French church and with the French king. And um, a, a notable detail here is that Bertrand and Philip actually had known each other for years. And um, in their youth, um, uh, they actually had been friends. <clears throat> Some say that there was um, um, a kind of an understanding of possibly even pact between Bertrand and Philip. Well, in 1305, there was a papal vacancy. Uh, the Catholic Church needed a Pope. And um, Clement actually jumps into the fray. He inserts himself in the process to elect a Pope. And he exerted pressure on the Cardinals and he succeeded in the improbable. He actually had Bertrand elected Pope. When Bertrand got this, um, uh, the, it got noticed that he had been elected Pope. Um, uh, he was not in Rome, he was in France, um, and he was actually um, taken off guard by the announcement. When Bertrand became Pope, 
um, he took the name Clement V. Uh, and to underscore his servitude to, um, to Philip, and perhaps to also snub uh, the College of Cardinals, he decided that his coronation ceremony was not going to be in in Rome, as was the as was the custom, but it was going to be in Lyon, France. One of his um, official acts was to create nine new French cardinals, and during his um, papacy, uh, he created so many French cardinals, uh, many of whom were his own relatives, uh, that he essentially guaranteed a long succession of French popes after him. But Clement's subservience to Philip didn't stop there. Um, he did something unheard of. He decided at one point to move the entire papal court and the administration of the Catholic Church from Rome, where it always had been, to Avignon, France. And by doing this, uh, Clement is, is credited with having created that, the 68-year uh, Avignon Papacy, also known as the, um, the Babylon captivity of the, of the papacy. Clement, uh, as I said earlier, it was an embarrassment to the papacy. He gave the church a black eye um, for not only moving uh, the papacy to Avignon, but for giving up the independence of the church and allowing it to be effectively um, controlled by a secular king. Um, Clement was in the back pocket of, um, of Philip um, until he died. And now it's time to introduce the third person in our story. Um, but before doing that, let's, let's just quickly review um, who we have. We have the Knights Templar. We have Philip IV. King of France, and we have Bertrand, our Clement the the the, the fifth, the Pope at this at this time, and now we're introducing um, Jacques de Molay. Jacques de Molay was the Grand Master um, in the last years of the of the Templar. And let's get the. Bad news out of the way first. And uh, the bad news is that um, Jacques Doblet was, was burned at the stake. Um, it was a pretty awful way to die, um, but it was the way reserved for heretics. But we actually know that Jacques Doblet was not a heretic. He was, he was framed. Here's a little background about Jack. Jacques, I should say. Um, he was born in 1244 to a mid-level noble family. He joined the Templars when he was 21 and he was knighted at the same time. And then um, when he was 26 in um, 1270, he was sent to the Middle East from France. But um, the Middle East was in turmoil. Uh, it was a war zone. And while the Templars there continued to protect pilgrims and the Holy Land, their efforts uh, were historically doomed. We don't know anything more about Jacques de Molay for the next 20 years until the year 1291. And this is the date, 1291, when the city of Accra fell to Islam. Accra had been the last Christian city and Templar fortress in the Holy Land, the very last. And when it fell, Christians were essentially, effectively kicked out of the Levant, the, uh, the entire Middle East. When Accra fell, um, the Templar order was um, forced to flee to the island of Cyprus. And it's precisely at this time that Jacques Vallée uh, becomes a major force within, within the Templars. Uh, he was elected the 23rd uh, Grand Master of the Order. And on his shoulders was an enormous task. He 
the work and the uh, and the purpose of the Templars had to be had to evolve um, because the Templars could no longer protect pilgrims and they could no longer protect the Holy Land. It fell on the Grand Master of the Order to rethink the entire mission of the Templars. So Jacques de Molay and other Templar uh, leaders laid out a plan to reform the order. And then they presented these to the Pope. But back in France, Philip IV had actually been um, lobbying the Pope, this very same Pope, and plotting to have the Templars uh, merged with the Knights Hospitaller. Now, the Knights Hospitaller in France um, was another militant religious order, but they were totally under the control of Philip. So if Philip succeeded in this merger that he had planned to do, um, uh, he would not only control the, the Knights Hospitaller, but he would also control the Templars and thereby be able to um, confiscate their entire wealth. Jacques de Molay um, obviously strongly uh, objected to these overtures. And this is when everything, everything goes wrong. Philip makes his move. He acts on a well thought out plan and decides once and for all that he's gonna get rid of the Templar, the Templar order. And to make this happen, he decides that it's not gonna be a secular of the, uh, affair or accusations, but he's going to get the church involved and specifically the, the inquisition. And um, so he brings, up the, uh, he brings up religious charges against the Templars, charges like um, heresy, uh, denying the, the, the divinity of Christ, spitting on the cross, um, uh, worshiping idols, even sodomy. Uh, what Philip expected was that the church would try, condemn, and eventually eliminate the, uh, the temple order, and that he would be able then to um, confiscate their, their wealth. During all of this, uh, Clement V did nothing. And so it did happen. And let me. The worst possible event happened. In the early morning of Friday, October the 13th, uh, 1307, with the support of the Inquisition, Philip sent troops throughout France uh, to arrest all Templars. Fortunately, most Templars had been tipped off and fled or went into hiding. But about 600 Templars, including Jacques de Molay, were captured, arrested, and um, imprisoned. They were tortured, and not surprisingly, almost all of them confessed. Um, Jacques de Molay's um, imprisonment uh, was one of the longer ones. It lasted for seven years. It was imprisonment and, and torture. About midway during Jacques de Molay's imprisonment um, in the year 1310, 54 Templars uh, were burned at the stake. And a few days later, uh, nine met the same fate. Then on March the 18th, 1314, that's uh, a critical date, March the 18th, 1314, four days uh, or four years after that mass um, execution of the Templars, Philip ordered um, four Templar leaders all out of, out of prison and he orders that they publicly admit their guilt. So Jacques de Molay and Geoffrey de Charnay were two of those four that were hauled out of prison, but neither of them cooperated. Instead, they took this opportunity to publicly defy Philip and declare there to all of the, everybody that was present 
their innocence. Uh, this infuriated uh, Philip, and um, this it was a public defiance of the king, and he ordered that these two Templars, uh, Jacques de Molay and um, Geoffrey de Charnay, be immediately executed. And they were. On that same day, um, in the evening in the shadows of Notre Dame, uh, Jacques de Molay and Geoffrey de Charnay were rowed out in a small boat to a small island on the Seine, to the, um, an island called the Ile aux Juifs, and they were executed. They were burned at the stake. Here's a moving quote about what actually happened that day. At sunset, a pyre was erected in the shadows of Notre Dame near the palace garden. There, Jacques de Molay and Geoffrey de Charnay were slowly burned to death, refusing all offers um, for pardon uh, for retraction. Bearing their torment with composure, they won for themselves the reputation of martyrs among the people who reverently collected their ashes as relics. Jacques de Molay was 70 years old when he died. He had been Grand Master of the Order of Templars for 20 years, and he was their last. You know, the, the story of the Templars might end here, um, with the dissolution of the, of the Templars, but it really doesn't. And it doesn't because there are several footnotes um, to the story. And the first footnote is um, about what's called the curse, the Jacques de Molay. Some say that when he was being burned at the stake, uh, he cursed Philip and Clement for having unjustly tried and condemned him. And others say that it wasn't a curse at all. It was uh, a solemn invitation uh, for Philip and Clement to join him before the throne of Almighty God so that God could decide who had been truthful and just and who had not. That was an invitation. And what happened shortly after this uh, was really kind of strange and spooky. Within the month, uh, Clement V dies. And as he was lying in state in the church where his body had been laid out, it was struck by lightning and his body was almost completely destroyed. And eight months later, the same year, uh, something happens to Philip. Um, in November of that year, 1314, Philip died in a hunting accident. And not only that, but Philip's name, his lineage, and his legacy were also erased when his three sons and a grandson also died. There's a second footnote. Okay. The second footnote is about, is about um, the Shinon parchment. I don't know if you've heard about those, but it's, it's, it's hard to believe. But 20, only 20 years ago, um, about 20 years, in 2001, in the secret archives of the Vatican, an astonishing discovery was made. An Italian, an Italian paleographer, a uh, researcher of ancient documents, um, uh, found two long buried papal documents. Together, these documents are called the Shinon parchment because um, of the castle of Shinon, where um, uh, many of the Templar leaders had been imprisoned by, uh, by Philip. One of these documents is a, is a, papal, de <clears throat> is a papal decree by, um, by um, Clement, dated 1308. 1308 is just one year after all those 600 um, Templars had been rounded up, arrested, and, and imprisoned. So in this document, um, um, Clement states 
that he absolved Jacques de Molay and the other Templars of all charges against them. In the second document, it, uh, or I should say the second document is actually a letter, a letter from Clement to Philip. And in this letter, Clement says that he as Pope and has had absolved all Templars and that he had, quote, restored them to the sacraments and to the unity of the church. These documents are uh, incontrovertible evidence that uh, Philip and Clement actually uh, colluded. Philip uh, by commission, Clement by omission to commit some pretty awful crimes. Um, crimes of dissolving the, the, the uh, Templar order um, without purpose or reason, the confiscation of their, of their wealth, and um, the killing of so many innocent uh, knights. You know, um, the Catholic Church, it took the Catholic Church 700 years um, to admit publicly that the, that the Templars were indeed innocent. And there was a muted apology about 10 years ago when some descendants of the Templars actually demanded that the church uh, respond to the Chinon parchment. So in the year 2011, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, uh, Joseph Ratzinger, um, apologized for the killing of Jacques de Molay and acknowledged that, that the Templars had been falsely accused. But he said nothing about uh, Clement, Clement V, or the church being responsible and, and complicit in all those murders. There's a third footnote. Uh, and it has to do with the Camino de Santiago, the legacy of the, of the Templars, and where today we have reminders of the Templar order along the Camino de Santiago. Some say that the, um, the chapels of Eonate and uh, Torres del Rio um, were built by the Templars. And today, these are uh, serene tributes to the spirit of the, of the Templars. In Aragon, uh, there's this mighty castle. It's a huge castle, the castle of Monzon, which is a reminder there of the Templars' many year role um, in the Reconquista. Uh, not too many people are aware of this because it's off in that corner in Aragon. The Templar castle, everyone knows, in Ponferrada. Um, and that's a great example of the of the work of the Templar, uh, their wealth and their strength. Um, the um, Jacques de Molay is said to have left this sword here on his way to Santiago. Another place is west of Leon, um, left west of Leon between Carrion de los Condes and a little town called El Burgo Ranero. Uh, between those two towns is a small village called Terradillos de los Templarios. And in that little town is an albergue that's named after Jacques de Molay. And it's dedicated to his memory and to the spirit of the, of the Templars. Um, also in this general area is, um, is an absolutely gorgeous uh, Romanesque church uh, in the Alcázar de Sirga. Uh, it's uh, Santa Maria La Blanca. Um, if you're ever there, if you actually the Camino goes right through there. Um, and this, this church actually belonged to the Templars until 1314 when the order was uh, dissolved. Paid a visit, it's great. Um, there are also many reminders of the Templars in Portugal. Uh, one of the largest is the mighty castle in uh, Tomar, um, which, by the way, uh, started construction in 1160. Now, 1160 is just about 20 years after the, 
the Templars were originally, originally founded in the, in the Holy Land. This castle is a, um, a testimony to the strength of the tem Templars and their role in helping the, the King of Portugal push back um, the forces of Islam that had invaded not only Portugal, but um, the Iberian Peninsula in 711. The fourth and, and final footnote uh, has to do with the question, are the Templars with us today, even today? Well, we all know that on um, Friday, October the 13th, 13, um, 1307, there were thousands of Templars um, throughout France and um, Europe. We also know that only 600 Templars were actually caught and imprisoned. So current thinking is that the Templars who were not rounded up by Philip either fled um, or um, were absorbed into other religious orders. Remember that Templars were monks. So they, many of them likely joined other religious orders and there were a number of them around, around at that time. In the early 14th century, um, there were the, the Knights um, Hospitallers were well known in France. Uh, in Germany, there was the, the militant Teutonic order in Portugal, um, the Order of Christ, which was uh, the immediate successor of the Order of uh, Templars when they were abolished in, in earlier in 1314. Um, the Order of Christ then um, took over all the Templars there. In Spain, um, there were already four militant orders uh, protecting pilgrims on the Camino de Santiago. Probably the main one was the, um, the um, Order of Santiago, or the, uh, what's called the Caballeros de Santiago. All right, one last thought. Um, even today, the echoes of the Templars abound. There are legends about the Templars, uh, stories about the Holy Grail, uh, very much alive in England and in Scotland, and uh, Dan Brown's book, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, Da Vinci Code, is, uh, is a good read and continues to be a good read. So, this is the end of my story um, about the legendary uh, warrior monks that we call the Templars. Uh, I focused on the last, uh, the later years of, of the order, and I'm leaving it up to you to read more about uh, the rich legacy of these brave uh, warrior knights. So thank you, and to everyone, un buen camino. Thank you. Thank you, Emilio, that was wonderful. You touched on some of the questions that came in, um, but I'll, I'll ask you the first one here is, uh, it kind of sounds like they were the first international bank. Can you talk to that a little bit? Yeah, the, 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 the banking system that the uh, Templars created was, um, um, uh, there were banks already, uh, you know, that, that actually gave out loans, but um, they developed as part of a, a, a system the way of uh, trans, uh, transferring money from one country to another and being able to make a deposit one place and being able to withdraw monies in, in another place. And also um, they, they were financiers. In other words, that they made great loans um, to, to nobles, nobles and kings. Kind of in that same vein, um, the question came, did the Templars finance buildings of the building of the Gothic churches? Did they play a role in building up the Camino trails through Spain? Well, um, we know that the, 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 the Templar fortress in Ponferrada was actually started earlier than, than the Templars, but it was turned over to them in uh, 1211. And um, they then uh, continued building it and uh, they fortified it as, as uh, partly a, a defense 
and a place of operation for uh, protection of pilgrims along the Camino Santiago. Um, you know, the, the, their, their presence in Villalcázar de Sirga, and um, remember that, that uh, Romanesque church that I mentioned there near um, Carrión de los Condes, um, it, uh, it, it was also a fortress. I mean, it was, if, you, if you've seen that church, you'll see that it's actually built like a fortress. Uh, and um, their, their presence in Aragón um, was also very well felt. Um, so yes, um, they actually helped to build uh, along the Camino de Santiago. And of course, you know, Eunate, although it's not been proven, um, there's not documentation of such, but Eunate and Torres del Rio um, seem to have a strong Templar influence. Wonderful. We had another question that said, any insights or comments on Tomas from Manharin? Oh, the last, the last Templar, uh, yeah, Tomas. Uh, uh, if, if anyone has been in Manjarin, uh, Manjarin is, is a little bit after uh, the Cruz de Ferro and uh, before uh, El Acebo. And it's, it's, it's quite a place, it's kind of run down, um, but um, uh, Tomas claims to be the last Templar or I have some direct connection with, I don't know, <laughs> I don't want to comment. I don't really know about that. All right, and Chris, Christiane, did you have your hand up? Oh, no, okay, no problem. Uh, here's our next question. Is the Villar de Dona on the Frances out of Porto Marin a Templar building? Yes, you know, there's some confusion about that, but I remember I, I've been there a couple of times and um, I've asked that question my, myself and, um, the uh, the sarcophagi that are there in that in that little chapel, uh, I asked about them whether they were templars, and they said uh, the person there said, well, no, actually they weren't. They were really caballeros de Santiago, so the Order of Santiago. Um, and um, if you think the templars really didn't um, build sarcophagi for themselves, um, they were knights. They were monks. Um, those sarcophagi are of noblemen, you know? And so, you know, there, there's that one with, with lions that are holding up the, the sarcophagus. And, and so these were nobles and um, the Caballeros de Santiago were known to be noblemen, um, very different from the Templars. All right, thank you. Um, we had our next question here was, can you talk a little bit about the places to visit while walking the Camino Frances in regard to the Templars? Well, um, um, the, the, the places that I can think of, um, are the ones that I mentioned um, on the Camino Frances. Um, you know, as, as, as you're approaching um, uh, Puente La Reina, there's a little deviation that you have to take through Obanos uh, to Eunate. Eunate is, is, is an absolute, an absolute treasure. Um, and its, it's footprint is, is uh, assumed to be um, a replica of the of the uh, Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, and that's one of the reasons that it's associated with the Templars. Um, I know that there are a couple of bridges that also have Templar influence. Uh, oh, actually, in in um, um, Puente la Reina, there's actually a church um, that has Templar influence that they were present there in that town. And then, of course, um, farther west, uh, there's, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, in uh, Villalcázar de Siria, and then later on in Ponferrada. Um, those, are, those are definite places to visit uh, and, and, and spend a little time. Uh, of course, also, you know, 
Terradillos de los Templarios. Uh, there's a lot of history there, uh, and everyone will want to talk to you about about the Templars and Jacques de Molay. Uh, every year they actually celebrate. Um, I don't know if it's birthday or his death or the or the uh, the uh, arrest of the of the uh, Templars there in Terradillos de los Templarios. And Emilio, along the same lines, we had a question for what is the Templar building in Irún? I don't know. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, um, I, in Irún. Um, mm -hmm. On the well, north today? Yeah, um, I'll make a note. I'll, uh, <laughs> I'd like to find out more about that. Uh, I'm, I don't doubt that there are many places, I, you know, I just don't know them all, yeah. Okay. Um, speaking of your talk, we um, the illustrations are remarkable. Can you talk about how you sourced them? How did you get those great pictures? Oh, gosh, I got them from all different places. Um, none are copyrighted, so um, uh, they're available on the internet. Um, mainly the internet. Um, uh, if you're looking at some of the, um, the Wikipedia uh, pages on the Templars, you might see a couple of the same ones I've used. Um, but um, yeah, none are, none are personal photos. Yeah, they're all, they're all public. Okay, great. And I think this is our last question uh, of the evening. If the Templar Knights who survived continued to be monks, how could there be descendants who are now Templars? Are they related family members or not related at all? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question because um, um, that, that it wasn't a lawsuit, although I think it's spoken uh, sometimes as a as a, a referred to as a, as a lawsuit. Um, when the Chinon parchment uh, was was made public, uh, there was an uproar, and um, some families, I think not directly the descendants, um, but some families by family names, and I think there was some question about whether there's uh, there were a legitimate, you know ancestor uh, or a descendant of the of the uh, of the Templars but they made made they made their case and their case was actually recognized by the church and um, and uh, Benedict the 16th actually uh, made a pronouncement which it, it may be difficult to find um, many references to this but uh, uh, it, it actually did happen now you're right that they were monks. But you know, in in reading about the Templars, um, you need to understand too that um, uh, they were warrior monks, and there were there were some legitimate um, complaints being made of um, the vows not being kept as strictly as you might expect monks to keep vows, and so there there, there were some le legitimate um, uh, claims made during the um, during the trials, you know, uh, that started after 1307. Well, we are so grateful, Emilio, for you spending time talking with us this evening. There are lots of positive comments and a lot of thank yous, and we appreciate your time and everything in the chat. So I want to pass those on to you as well. Thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. We really appreciate it. Um, just a couple of announcements, just so you know. This video will be posted on our American Pilgrims YouTube channel in about a month. It'll be available and also previous talks are available as well on our um, YouTube channel. And also, if you would like, every time you use Amazon, you can give a donation to American Pilgrims through our smile.amazon account. And if you need uh, information on how to do that, you can email us and we'd be happy to help you do that. If you are headed out on a Camino anytime soon, you are welcome to get your credential on our website, which I know there's a lot of folks planning some, some Caminos this year. And also, if you have not already, you can connect to your local channel chapter on our, um, on our website as well. So you have those uh, resources available to help you prepare and connect with other pilgrims 
uh, in your area or maybe not in your area. You can also attend uh, Zoom events that you can find out that are available on our website as well. And so we appreciate you spending your evening with us. Buen Camino and have a wonderful day. Yes, Buen Camino.